so we finish every year with our power hours with this presentation. We talk around what I'm going to look for in the year forward. I start by marking what I spoke about last year. There has to be some level of accountability. I've given the secret before on how you do predictions. The, 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 the simple thing is assume trends continue because change happens infrequently. It's a little more nuanced than that, but I think it is important, particularly in this industry, there's a lot of throwing things out there and saying things, wild or not, but there's no accountability. No one comes back and says, hey, what about, and this sort of stuff. So we start with that part of the process. I'll go into some big thoughts for the year, then we'll go into some stocks and then some predictions for 2024. I've got to say, this is never an easy presentation, but this one perhaps has been harder than many. Uh, I, I remember the one we did in December 2019, which was perfectly easy because we didn't know about COVID and such things back then. We knew nothing. Uh, even the one in, in, in December 2020 wasn't too bad because we'd seen stuff coming. But we sit in a weird place on planet Earth right now, but we'll delve into a bunch as we get more to that. So let me turn that on so that it works. There we go. So some predictions that I made a year ago. Uh, I said the top 40 would be green, but not by much. And it was, but not by much. I said the RAND would be stronger, but not by much. It wasn't. The RAND is the one that always catches me. There's always a good reason why it should go stronger, and it often, it, it, even right, uh, I'll come to that more in a bit. I expected local inflation back in the range. Uh, it has got back into the range, the 3 to 6%. We are now nudging higher at that level, although a chunky petrol price increase for December, which will help us all on our holiday travels, uh, should help that to a degree as well. I said we're not going to see rate cuts this year. And I know as we sit here in December now, of course we're not going to see rate cuts this year. But a year ago, it was like, remember inflation was trans transitory? Remember, it was going to just be a little bit. We'd have a little bit of rate cuts. A year ago, I went back and was reading some of the reports. There were talks that the, the Fed might start, cut, start cutting rates in June of this year, which in hindsight is absolutely crazy. Um, I said, who's our president next December? Certainly not Sora Maposa. Remember what happened a year ago now? Paula Paula report came out of parliament, which essentially said the president had a case to answer for. Um, and at the time, uh, he certainly, his gut response to Greta Mantasha was, I'm going to quit. It's the right thing to do. I will stand down. This was also, remember, ahead of the elective conference for the ANC, which was held at Nasrec some two weeks later. Um, and certainly within the higher echelons of, of the ANC, and certainly within Roma Paul's inner circle, there was a fear that he would stand down, that he would not stand for election at the, the Nasrec elective conference, which when you think about half a million dollars in a couch, and you think about how big that couch has to be, and you think about a campaign of clean president, seemed like the right thing to do. And I know the fear a year ago was, but if it's not Sora Maposa president, who is it? Yeah, and I think a lot of the argument was the devil that you know uh, versus a clean devil, it's complex. Nonetheless, I really thought that he would do the right thing. Um, I think he didn't. Nonetheless, he's still president. I got that wrong. Uh, US, I said, would be green, and I said both S&P and NASDAQ would be green. Remember, last year, bear market. Yes, for those of you who joined the market after 20, 2009, it was your first offshore bear market. It was a, it was a harrowing experience for many. Uh, the, 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 the level of upside in the US surprised the heck out of me. Truthfully, it's a magnificent seven, but we'll come to that in a bit. Um, I said we would have recession. We haven't had recession. Uh, it has been the most anticipated recession, but then economists have predicted, what, nine of the last three recessions. So, but we'll come back to that in a bit more. I said inflation in the developed markets is not coming back to targets, which is 2%. And I still think that. It, 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 it's, the, the easy part is getting it down from the 9% in the US, the 11% in the UK. That initial part is easy. It's base effect. It's the year-on-year -year effect. Our first big number down was June and July because that was when we hit 7% for the first time last year. Then it starts to get tough, and I think it's going to stay tough. I thought value would beat growth. I couldn't have been more wrong if I tried. It, it was magnificent seven. They, of course, are out-and-out out growth. Uh, value didn't stand a chance against that. I thought Europe would do better, would be the better developed market. Europe actually had a very good year, but it didn't come close to NASDAQ. Um, it came close to S&P, but not to NASDAQ by any stretch. Europe, uh, Eurostox 50 is the index I'm looking at there. I said Chinese GDP would be below 5%. That was predicated in a couple of thoughts. There's zero COVID policy. Xi Jinping uh, and the elective conference, he went for an unprecedented 
third term. Um, and I, I just, there's issues around China. We'll come to those more in a bit as well. And I said the Russia-Ukraine war would still be ongoing. I didn't expect there to be another war, this one now, of course, in the Middle East. But the Russian-Ukraine war is going nowhere. It's now just gridlocked. No one can win it. No one's going to back off from it. And now the world's moved on. And when I say moved on, they've moved on to the, the war in Israel. So the Russian-Ukraine war is going to be around probably until Vladimir Putin dies. It's a crass thing to say, but I don't see how else it ends. Um, so not bad. I've done better. It's a passing mark. And, and not a matric pass, but I think you need 30%. I mean, like a, a proper pass, right? A 50% passing mark, which is what really, really matters. Um, but then also I threw out some stocks at the end of the presentation. So I thought, let's go have a look at what those stocks looked like. Uh, and there's a lot of green there, but man, there's some reds. ShopRites, man, I just always like ShopRite. Asterixes mean I own it as of right this minute. Um, my portfolio is always published at simonbrown.coza. I liked Pepco. The market didn't. Uh, I liked banks. They did well. Coronation, uh, sorry, ABSA. Uh, ABSA. You know, ABSA is like the cheapest bank forever in a day, and it just was always the cheapest bank. I just wrote an article for Financial Mail, and I made the point that I make all the time, and then often I don't follow. When you look at a sector like banks, and you think to yourself, banks are cheap. Which one should I buy? Buy the best, i.e. not ABSA. Because I keep, you know, I know it's like, oh, well, you buy the lagger and then they're going to catch up and they're going to win. You know what? Winners know how to win. Winners carry on winning. Not absent. Coronation? Well, Coronation is going fine until SARS said we want a billion czar from you. Uh, it could be worse. It could be dollars, but it's a billion czar. The end of the year flat. These are including dividends, so we take that. Sun International? Uh, it was the leisure trade, right? In fact, that went all the way back to Omic. Well, if you were really brave, it went back to 2020. Otherwise, there was November 26, 2021, when Omicron was discovered and uh, all the borders got shut down to South Africa and our leisure stocks got decimated. Uh, I, uh, City Lodge was the other one, didn't do particularly well. Sun International was the nice one there. Uh, property. I'll come back to that slightly down. Two stocks, Octodec and Vrakile, both did nicely individual. Uh, this was done on Tuesday afternoon. They've actually had a slightly better Wednesday, Thursday, but nonetheless, uh, they're both in the green. EU, nice. Biggest mover of the bunch. Uh, Tiger Brands, I really thought Tiger Brands perhaps more for a takeover than anything else, but Tiger Brands disappointed. And the top 40, including dividends, up 7%. Fun fact, 10-year compound annual growth rate total return, 7.2. I say, it doesn't feel like a 7% year. It feels like we're minus 54 or something like that. It feels like we've been battered into oblivion, yet there we are, top 40, up 7%, including dividends. So that was my record. Not bad, saved by a couple of winners. That's often how portfolios work. We'll take that, no problem. The bigger issue then is, I then ask, the, the crowd, the masses, I say, what do you expect to happen? So a year ago, I did this tweet and I said to folks, what are you expecting the market to do? Two thirds said green and two thirds were right. It was close. Here's the fun fact. I think I've done this presentation eight times, maybe. I'm not sure, a lot of times. Every time I've done that slide, every time the crowd has been right. They've never been wrong, which is just wild. So as always, this week, I put a tweet out. I said to the crowd, What's your expectation for uh, uh, next year? Uh, I closed the poll at 10 o'clock this morning. At 10 to 10, it was 50-50. It was exactly 50-50. And I don't mean by rounding error. I mean half the votes one side, half the votes the other side. And then there was a sudden, and sorry, I'm getting phone calls. Let me make that. Oh, no, it's not ringing. Um, and then there was a sudden run, and we ended up with a slight edge saying green. I think if I'd had a flat option, it would have won. It just doesn't feel, standing here right now, that next year is going to be an awesome year. It doesn't feel like this was a year where we made money. 7% real return on the JSC, well, 7% return on the JSC, inflation, call it 5.9, and that's a real return of 1.1. Okay, no one getting rich on that, ain't no one retiring, ain't no one doing much exciting. But again, I say it doesn't feel like it. So, let's get on to some of the burning questions for 2024. There are lots of them and they are burning. And the first one has been on this slide now for four or five years and it's ESCOM. And the burning question is simple. No, ESCOM just doesn't work. I mean, it's just that simple. 
ESCOM just doesn't work. There is, however, stuff happening. We've got nine gigawatts pipeline by private industry. Uh, that's nine stages of load shedding. Solar panel imports from China in just the first half of this year, up 400%, 3.4 gigawatts, which in of itself is three stages of load shedding. Yet here we are in stage six. ESCOM is actually getting worse. Now, I want to say, how's that possible? But then you pause and you think, hmm. Now, I, mean, I know some people who work at ESCOM and I'm not dissing them in the least, but as an entity, ESCOM is simply getting worse. It is completely broken. Load shedding is going nowhere. But one of the absolute delights of my job is I get, I get to interview ridiculously smart people and call it work. So today I got to chat to the chief investment officer, I think, of Old Mutual Investment Group for 20 minutes. A, a really a, an excellent conversation. Um, and I learned a ton. And he had a really good point. He says, what we're seeing in South Africa is privatization by stealth. What I mean by that, you're putting solar panels on your roof. You go outside into any shopping center in South Africa, you see all the solar panels. You see what's happening at the mines and industry around South Africa. We're privatizing power supply, but not because the government stood up and said, let's privatize power supply. That will never happen. We're privatizing it because we need to make a plan. It used to be a broader market plan. Now it's just a South African market plan. And we do. I was chatting with Stephen Joffe in Victor, his results earlier in the week, and I said to him, how's load shedding hurting your customers? He says, surprisingly, not so much. The Oaks just make a plan. You know, there's a factory I know, so they look at their load shedding schedule. They need an eight-hour window to run things, and sometimes that eight-hour window is 10, in the 10 at night until 6 in the morning. Cool. That's when the shift runs. The staff aren't chuffed, but they got a job. They come in. They do it. They're just making a plan. We are privatizing ESCOM. We're doing it by stealth. ESCOM is just not fixable. And the risks of that are, what, quarter of a trillion dollars as are of debt. I mean, it's a horror story. But there's, there's no fixing ESCOM from where it is now. We are privatizing it by stealth. That 3.4 gigawatts is probably going to be even bigger in the second half of the year. It will probably go up even more next year. It's helped in part by the finance minister's uh, tax proposal for business, 125% rebate is certainly helping. But the short answer is we are privatizing our ESCOM, which then brings us to Transnet. So I'm a Durban boy. I grew up in and around KZN. Those of you who know Durban, you would come off at Amschlonga to what used to be the Sharks Board um, and Sugarcane Fields, and is now Gateway Shopping Center and everything. And there's an excellent drive then down to the M4. And you've got a beautiful vista over the bay. And I used to count the ships. And I remember once counting 12 ships. And that was the record of my entire life. And at that point, I was a kid. This is probably 30 or 40, no, 40 odd years ago. 12 ships at anchor outside Durban Harbor. They're currently 32. There's a whole bunch of ships that are in harbor, but can't get the cargo off. Uh, Transnet was the, the freight line. The Richards Bay Coal Terminal is going to do 47 million tons this year. It's, it's rated for 78. We've got the coal, we've got the iron ore, we can ship it, the world wants it, the prices are nice, we simply can't get it to port. What are we doing? We're privatizing. How are we doing that? Well, trucks. Unfortunately, if you drive the N3, you see the trucks, it's far from ideal. The problem with this is how does a PEP call solve the problem? Can they air freight? No, cost. So what can they do? Well, they work out that there's a six-week delay at Durban Port, so they order six weeks in advance, and that just ties up working capital. You know, a South African makes a plan, but the plan is costly and the plan is messy. And then water. This is Durban Beachfront, my favorite part in the world. Durban should be our Miami. It is the best winters. Okay, February in Durban, like, get the heck out of town. It's the best winters. I go there every winter. I love it. I do that beachfront. The beachfront is absolutely beautiful. Don't step off the beachfront, but stay on the promenade. It's eight kilometers from the harbor mouth all the way through to Blue Lagoon. It is just absolutely paradise in winter. It is glorious, everything about it. And those paddling pools haven't had water for two and a half years. Rachel Finlayson, which is a 50 meter open water pool, um, open air pool on the, on, the, on the bay. And it's beautiful because on the one side, you've got the beach and the other side, you've got the hotels. It is my favorite training pool in the world. In the last 10 years, I swam there four times. Not because I don't go often, but because it's never open. It's a swimming pool, guys. How hard is that? Water, chlorine. I don't know. Maybe it is hard. I don't know. I don't own a swimming pool. 
Water is the bigger problem. How do we privatize water? Someone, who was it, said to me, I forget who, you can make electricity, you can't make water. This is the next big issue. Our water in Gauteng comes from Lesotho, that uh, phase two of the Lesotho Highlands Water Project was supposed to be finished in 2021. I'm not even sure if it's been out to tender yet. Elections. 40 countries have elections in 2024. It is the year where the most people will go to vote for a new leader. We've never had so many elections. The big one, obviously the US. It is going to be a mess of note. Someone will win it. Someone will deny it. And it'll be, yeah, all those words which you can't say in polite company and in front of children. It's going to be an absolute complete mess. I mean, I, that election is, what, almost a year away, and it's already, like, like they, they spend years in the election cycle. Um, it does matter who wins. There are different policies. What we've seen in America is the divide between the Republicans and the Democrats has got wider and wider. We've seen that divide the world over um, as the two sides sort of shout and hate each other more and more. Is it social media? I don't know. It doesn't matter. It does matter who wins. Um, it's going to be messy. The UK has got an election. There, I really don't think it matters. I think the Conservatives and Labour are broadly the same. And I think the UK as a powerhouse is just no longer a powerhouse. Remember the phrase, the sun never sets in the British Empire. And then it did about 120 years ago, and it's been setting ever since. Every single force, whether economic, military, whatever, that has existed on planet Earth has at some point eventually ultimately decayed. The one exception is the US. I would argue that they are decaying, but it's just taking some time. Um, of course, it takes time, and the UK still thinks they're a force, but they're long since over. Locally, we've got an election. It will be May. It will probably be uh, around about the 8th of May, because then they can all do political rallies on the 1st of May and all the uh, shindig around that. Uh, the ANC is under immense pressure, but they will get to form a government. They will get to form a coalition. Maybe the EFF. I think maybe the IFP. The ANC, so if you, if, you, if you remember KZN in the 80s, you know that the ANC and the IFP absolutely hate each other. Um, but then people, and credit to him, Jacob Zuma, Masiba Lakota, came back in the early 90s and created peace in, in, in uh, uh, the, the KZN. 20,000 people died in the civil war there at that, during that decade. Um, and I know that the IFP has signed up for the coalition moon packed fly thingy majiggy, which says you can't do a deal with the, AN, with the ANC. But the, the IFP is, is nationalistic, as is the ANC. Um, I think there's a deal to be done at a national level and then provincial, because I think they're going to lose Gauteng. I think they'll lose uh, uh, in the Natal, and they haven't won the Western Cape in decades. The problem with coalition politics is look around coalition politics doesn't work. I mean, it does. It does, right? Italy's had, well, okay, Italy's a terrible example. Let me take that back. Uh, Germany. Germany is coalition politics. Angela Merkel ruled Germany for, what, 20 years, 15 years? Coalition politics. Coalition politics can work, but it can also be fundamentally broken. Hello, Joburg. How many, do we have a mayor? And if we do, what's their name? And if we don't know their name, how many mayors have we had since an election just was it two years ago, three years ago, three years ago? Coalition politics is messy, particularly when their ego is involved. Guess what politicians have? Egos. So the ANC won't get 50%, but they will get back into power. And that is both good and bad. It takes off some of the levers, um, but it does mean that our parliament, I think, is deadlocked. Truthfully, I mean, I don't know. Is our parliament a roaring example of wonderfulness right now? Mm -hmm. Okay, enough said there. So there will be an election. As I said, I expect ours around the 8th of May or there's about, I think 8th of May is a Wednesday. So it'll be then. I'm planning the public holiday. So let's go some offshore inflation. That is the highest inflation in the US in 40 years. And if you remember back to this point here, it was transitory. Well, it did kind of sort of maybe perhaps tr transition, but it got immensely painful in that process. Uh, and that chart is not similar to anywhere else. Developed markets the world over, highest inflation in 40 years. That takes you back to the early 80s. What was that? Well, that was Nixon off the gold standard in the early 70s. It was the OPEC crisis, the oil wars. Uh, the US had interest rates at 15%. Uh, it was an absolute and utter mess. 
The easy part is now over. The hard part is getting it back to 2%. I do think there is a good argument to say that rates have peaked for now. The for now part is that there are risks out there. Those risks are, well, war in the Middle East. So the war in the Middle East has not got, when it first broke out six weeks ago, I did a podcast and I spoke about the worst case scenario where Iran tried to draw Saudi Arabia in by firing on Saudi Arabian uh, refineries. And I know this sounds crazy, but I mean, it's war, right? What about war isn't crazy? Um, and that suddenly starts putting, uh, bringing supply out of Saudi Arabia's market that puts more sanctions onto Iran. Notwithstanding, Iranian oil is sanctioned as is Russian, but all that oil is finding its way into the market, mostly via India and China. There was a place where this went horribly wrong. Oil went to 100, 150, and inflation just went straight through the roof. That has been averted and looks like an unlikely scenario. It was never a very high likelihood scenario. But there is stuff out there in this market that can still just kind of go wrong and, and just cause inflation to be sticky or to start to edge higher again and to freak out central bankers. We did see a slight uptick in US unemployment at the last unemployment data. I would have go to 3.7 if memory serves or something like that, um, which Jerome Powell has been saying for a year and a half. He expects weakness in the, in the uh, uh, labor market. That starting to come through is good. Uh, no, it's not good. People are losing jobs, but it's good in the sense that what it means is that the process is, is working and putting pressure on consumers. Because what you do when you've got inflation and you, you raise rates, what are you trying to do? You're trying to hurt the consumer. Not lacquer, but that is truthfully what central bankers are doing. And they've got two tools, interest rates, blunt, and words, extremely blunt. So the talk coming out of central bankers remains very hawkish. And in fact, we had one of the Fed uh, uh, members, voting members just this week saying she's voting for another rate cut at the next, sorry, rate hike at the next meeting. Is she, is it talk? I don't know, but certainly the inflation remains sticky. I think getting it back to that 2% target is not going to be easy. Not by a long shot. We've seen significant wage inflation. We've got home price inflation in the US for a bunch of reasons. None the least that if you signed a 30-year mortgage locked in at 3%, you don't want to now sign a new mortgage and lock in at 7%. So there's not houses coming into the market. There's also not enough houses being built since the financial crisis in 2008. There is a housing shortage in America. So property prices go crazy. So there's a lot there that can really get quite ugly in the inflation space. I think that balance of probability, inflation's probably beaten, but it's not over. Getting back to two is hard, but it can kind of stay in that sort of two and a half to three and a half percent. And that will keep the Fed happy and it'll say to them, we don't need to raise more rates. That was the fastest raise, ra raising, raising of rates since again, the 1980s. Unprecedented, essentially from zero to five and a half in, I mean, just double quick time, absolutely double quick time. I think it's peaked. I think globally interest rates have peaked. There is risk to that statement. I appreciate it, but I do think rates have peaked. The question is, when do rates start to come down? If you look at the frost market in the US, they'll tell you March. I will tell you the frost market is drunk. There is no way the Fed is cutting rates in March. Not in any, in any world. Maybe in South Africa, we see a March cut. I don't even think that's likely. I think we'll see 75 point of cut next year, take prime down to 11. The first one, uh, if it's March, next is uh, June. No, May, maybe May, probably June. Central bankers are by their very nature cautious. What we did see at the last MPC last week was an interesting shift. The last couple of pauses at the MPC, the vote has been three, two. Three to pause, two to raise. This time it was five, zero, five to pause. The two who have been looking to raise for the last couple of MPCs have switched. That, to me, is the big story. The governor, of course, did what all governors do, be hawkish, scare the heck out of us, tell us the world is ending, don't spend money, hide under your bed. But that's what central bankers do. We shouldn't be surprised by that. But two voted from next raise to next let's not raise. That is, I think, very, very significant. But I think rates can largely be on pause, probably in the UK as well, uh, probably in the EU, Australia, eh, 
probably Australia, but Australia really, Australia is a weird place. 10 year yields. We had a 30 year bull market in bonds. Remember, yield down, price up. From that high in the 80s, north of 15%, all the way down to almost zero. Remember negative yields. Remember when there were trillions of dollars of sovereign bonds yielding negative. In other words, I give you my money and you give me back less, and I'm happy about that. You know what it is? In times of, of euphoria, you want return on your capital. In times of fear, you want return of your capital. And if I got to pay a small premium, half a percent to get my money back, guaranteed because you're the Swiss or the Germans or whatever, eh, I'll pay that money. Just shows the fear. That has fundamentally changed. That is a, a, a fundamental shift. And the, the shift is huge on many levels. So it got to 5%, it's moderating, it's probably gonna come back down. Is it gonna get back to sub two? Probably no. What's the key thing here is debt is how this planet moves. Whether you're a private individual and it's a car or home loan or credit card, whether you're a corporate or whether you're a government, debt is how things move. And that debt just got a heck lot more expensive. 40% of US debt expires in the next three years. Has to be rolled over. They will roll it, no problem, absolutely no problem. People will hand over fist by US debt. But most of that debt is probably issued mm, sub 3%. It's going to be coming in higher. We're going to be seeing higher debt costs at government levels the world over. And there's a good old fashioned way, right? When you've got more money going out, in this case, because of debt, you've got two options. Raise money coming in, taxes, not going to happen, cut spending. Or more deficit. There's going to be spending crunches on governments. And this isn't a 2024 story. This is a story that's going to run for a while longer as governments suddenly find that squeeze. In emerging markets, less of an issue because we've always paid high debt. I mean, we're currently paying, what, 10% uh, on our tenure, but you know what, we've paid eight or nine, seven and a half, ten. 10. Uh, but for the US to go from one to five on their tenure is a giant deal. And it puts a hole in treasury. And that then says to Congress, balance this budget. Yeah, we see how that works, right? Don't hold your breath, you will turn blue. Um, this is our 10 year return in the top 40, total annualized. CAGR 7.2%. We had a large period of going nowhere. I personally blame Christia van Heerden for that because she entered the market about there and uh, did nothing for about five years. We needed a pandemic to get things going. Um, the pandemic was a horror. Then we went to the races. There was a point this year where things were looking really, really good. It was the 12th of January. <laughs> We hit an all-time high and um, didn't look so good thereafter. We actually turned negative at one point this year. We were down uh, for the year. We managed to scrape a, we did 7% including dividends for the year. Our 10-year CAGR 7.2. 7.2, inflation over the period, four and a half. So we're netting 2.7 real growth. Positive, it's not exciting. And of course, it depends where you got in. I and mean, if you were the clever person who jumped in at, you know, March of 2020, I mean, someone did, right? And they're an absolute guru and, and I don't know, they should be our next, actually, no, we've got a great finance minister. They should be our next something or other. Um, not a terrible return at all. Different sectors, it's all been about the Indy. That Indy was back in the day, it was SAB Miller and Richmond. Uh, then it was NASPAS and Process. And now it's back to being Richmond again. Uh, again, this is 10 year total return. Top 40 up, up, hold on, up 75 for the period. Banks, 40%. Midcaps 26, Resi 21. 10-year total return, not CAGR, total return over the period, 21%. Horror return. Truthfully, because we're starting back in a period where it just went really, really bad, particularly for the PGM guys, and it took them, I mean, the COVID pandemic to get green. And then since then, they've done okay, but it hasn't been particularly fun. Basically, they did that 20% since sort of mid-2020. Otherwise, it's been a horror. That is the nature of commodities, deeply cyclical. Unfortunately, we are in a commodity economy. Uh, commodities is China. Uh, Richmond is China. Uh, NASPAS is China. Process is China. Half of our market is China. At times, that's great. Right now, maybe not so great. Uh, US dollar index, 
It's had three big waves in the history of this index. One in the 40s, Bretton Wood, one in the 70s, Nixon, and then more recently, pandemic. It was looking really good at that point, and then it went crazy again, and now we're seeing the dollar index coming lower. That tells us that Iran should be stronger. Every EM currency in the world is stronger, except the Tsar. We did get to 1794 about two weeks ago. We hold on to it for about 10 minutes, and now we're 1850, 1860. Uh, that is the world voting on us, quite frankly. View the currency as a way people vote. But also understand that fund managers the world over don't really care about your politics and the like. They care about a risk-adjusted return. If they can make money, they'll invest anywhere. This is not a space for morals and scruples. This is a space for, 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 for profits. If we zoom that in, certainly a move down to just above the 100 and ultimately perhaps a move lower. If rates have peaked, if things don't get terrible out there, if we don't see oil going crazy, inflation going crazy, and more interest rate hikes. And there were a lot of ifs in that statement. If all of that happens, we should see dollar strength, sorry, dollar weakness as money comes out. Because when people are scared, what do they do? They send the money to America. Take at one point back there earlier this year, you could send your money to the States, you could buy a government bond and earn yourself 5% guaranteed yield with your risk being the US government. Yes, they got a downgrade, but there's still many A's and all the rest. That will start, if, if, if things start to improve next year, or perhaps are less scary, I think we can certainly see more dollar weakness, and that should flow through to emerging market currency strength, and at some point, maybe czar strength. Our elections are going to be messy. Coalition governments, the market is going to take a fairly standoffish now, the market's going to be confused. In the one sense, ANC below 50, yay. In the other sense, coalition, oh no. How are they going to vote? We'll find out come May when the elections happen, I suspect. Um, a lot of ifs in the statement, but that's broadly where I am leaning towards. Uh, that is the czar, and it's just a currency that goes weaker over time. It does do incredibly stronger at points in time. Uh, this was Sir Maposa announcing his cabinet, 1154. It lasted for about as long as it took him to announce the cabinet, and then it went on a tear. As I said, we did see a little bit of strength a week or two ago. The big number to really watch is about the 1750. Can we go stronger? We can. We need lots to happen. We need dollar weakness, and we need commodities. We're a commodity economy. We need China. Actually, we need China to come to the party. Um, and is China going to come to the party? We'll come back to that in a moment. A lot of this, we need to remember, I mean, stuff I'm not even touching on, and that's the sort of year it's been. Uh, Ray listed. Uh, Lady R. I mean, it turned out Lady R wasn't even us selling arms to the Russians, which everyone, right? The Russians don't use NATO weapons, right? Because let's be clear, they're Russian. They don't like NATO. We only make NATO weapons. We were never selling arms to the Russians. But, I mean, something happened on that dock in Simonstown. We've got the photos, and now we've got bright lights. Oh, power came back. <laughs> um, nonetheless, the RAND, we'll come to that in a bit. It can go either way. It is the currency. What else? Commodities. This is a lot on this chart. Just look at the top left first. Iron ore, gold, they had the good year. And then look down at the bottom. Coal, rhodium, palladium, uh, platinum, uh, Brent. One of my wild calls last year was I said Brent would be red, and it was by about 20 cents, but yeah, I was right on it. Um, a tough, tough, tough year for commodities. It doesn't get a lot better for PGMs in a hurry, I don't know. Anglo Platinum just got kicked out of the Resi 10. Well, it will be at the next rebalancing in two weeks, and I can't find out when last Anglo Platinum wasn't in the Resi 10. It's like, yeah, Anglo Plat, you're out. Uh, Harmony's coming in. Harmony, a little junior upstart gold miner. Hmm. Um, S&P 500, this is just post the pandemic, a spectacular year. Uh, we're not back yet at all-time highs. NASDAQ, same story, not back at all-time highs. 35% year to date is crazy. That is the Magnificent Seven. Thank you for playing. Uh, valuation, still not cheap. This is trailing uh, price earnings, 24.7. The median is much closer to 20. And if you look at the NASDAQ, 35, 34 and a half, the medium is much closer to 26. US markets are not cheap. But if we take out the Magnificent Seven, then they look a whole lot better. I've got a Russell pot chart here in a moment. Bitcoin, ugh, Bitcoin's a risk asset. If you want to take risk, buy Bitcoin. If you don't like your money, buy Bitcoin. 
I think the world's going to end by champagne. Go down in a bath of bubbles. UK inflation at 11%, moderating election next year, FTSE flat for the year, some decent valuations. I prefer the European Union. I haven't got much I can be enthusiastic about the Mud Island. China, world's second largest economy, common prosperity remains. Uh, US tech sanctions, which were started under Trump, are ongoing and in fact getting heightened. The difference is Trump did them on Twitter and Biden does them by official channels. Uh, GDP struggling. We've seen deflation, although that has seemingly passed. House price data came out this morning, early, early, year-on-year uh, -year growth, minus 0.1%. Understand how a Chinese person accumulates, has, or owns wealth is property. They buy property. The regions made money by selling property to these developing companies and then collecting the rates. And as long as things were going up, it was great, right? You sell off plan. You haven't even built it. You've got a piece of land and a nice banner and a, a plan and you sell these properties. And by the time the person actually takes transfer, the property's worth 20% more. Everybody's happy until it's not. Until by the time you take transfer, the property's less 20% 20, 20 down. Until it doesn't get built because the go-go process isn't working. Evergrande, not the ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal, the property company in uh, China is basically defaulting on debt. I think Tuesday is the D-Day, although there's been many D-Days. And what they're saying is, look, our debt is worthless because we are bankrupt. How about we give you some equity? And no surprise, the market is like, yeah, I don't think we want your equity. Um, th th there is a problem here. But understand, again, it's back to China. Xi Jinping with his third term will manage the fallout as best he can. It's not going to be easy. It's never plain sailing, but it is a managed economy and it is managed. And I always say, if you want to know what's going to happen in China, it's really easy. Go read what this, go read the speeches by Xi Jinping. He tells you what he's going to do. And then he does it because if you don't do it, there's a gulag with your name on it. And it's not nice, but it's how it operates in China. It's going to be harder because of property, because of, of, of concerns around uh, uh, Chinese citizens, their wealth. They haven't got their flats. The flats are worth less than they paid, and they haven't been built yet. There are going to be loads of issues around that. The key thing from his, when he, got, when he got his third term at the conference in October last year, is he went back to his phrase around common prosperity. And this is what he was talking about when he did the, tech, the crackdown on the tech stocks. That's what he was talking about when he says, when he did the crackdown in education companies. He doesn't want these elite. That's not what he was looking for. He wants prosperity, but he wants everyone to be prosperous, not to have some crazy rich people. And he wants to try and manage that. Largely, he's got Alibaba and Tencent and he's whipped them into shape. Ant has been broken up and paid a fine and will be fine. Um, the education sectors are done. If you're a kid, if you're under certain ages, you can only play on your phone two hours a week on Friday evening or whatever it is. He decrees it happens. It absolutely does. The next place he's going to crack down, just a top tip, it's going to be healthcare. Uh, Discovery owns a stake in Ping An, which is a healthcare company in China. When that happens, Discovery is going to get slaughtered on the market. That stake, the Ping An stake, that Discovery owns is worth about a buck fifty of the share price. In other words, if you like Discovery and China cracks down on healthcare and Discovery falls 30%, there's your entry point. If you don't like Discovery, don't bother. But Ping An is worth about a buck fifty and Discovery's luck. They're going to go after healthcare. There's going to be lots more talk. The zero COVID policy was call it what you will, he's undone it. A year ago, COVID deaths and the like were spiking again. That has passed, they're beyond it. But what we're not seeing is that go-go engine driving because it was so much driven by the regions and the property market, the building, the demand for steel, for copper, for labor, for, for interiors, for houses, for chairs and kitchen fittings and, and, and moving trucks and all of that sort of thing, new schools and everything. The Chinese GDP under 5% next year, I don't think it's going to be a heck lot better. So this year, I don't think it's going to be a heck lot better next year. And the problem is, we need China to come on board to buy our commodities. 
and without them, where are commodities going? Now, there's two drivers for commodities. A weaker dollar should be good for commodity prices. Typically, this history says weaker dollar, good for commodity prices. But really, we want China to come back on board at the same time. Iron ore doing fine. 120, 130 dollars. Uh, Australia is now selling iron ore again um, into China. A whole bunch. We're struggling to get our iron ore to the ports. We know that story. But iron ore, the price is doing fine. Coal, the price has come back to about 120. The IMF says they expected about 100 dollars a ton next year. But you know what? The long-term average is 75, and our coal guys are making plenty money at 100 dollars a ton. PGMs I worry about a lot. Gold we will get to in a moment. We're going to start moving into El Nino. Things are going to get drier. We had three years of great rains. Our farmers loved it. Stocks like Cop Agri and others did great. And Victor, you've got uh, uh, not Victor Omnia and stuff, fertilizer and all of that. They've done great. We're going to be moving into a dry period. This season, speaking with Wandili Shalobo, uh, Chief Economist at AgriBiz SA, seems fine. Next year, year after, might get a little bit tricky in that regard. Uh, infrastructure, it's just not happening. Everyone, everyone promised us infrastructure spend during the pandemic because it's a great way for governments to boost. But even the Build Back Better, which was, I forget how many trillions of dollars, we're just not seeing it. Although Sanrail has announced they're going to retender about seven billion odd worth of tenders going out. If you look at Robex, there is work out there, um, but the infrastructure is just generally not happening because why governments are being squeezed tax revenues are so so and remember debt is costing more infrastructures it's not a nice to have but if that bridge is going to fall down all you've got to hope is it doesn't fall down while you're in office i'm serious so you can kick that can leisure I mean, it hasn't, it, it's still out there. It's still happening. I, I just come, I went to Mauritius and back. That plane was 100% full, both directions. Okay, it was a 320, 200 seating, what, 137 people, not a massive plane. Third of it business, two thirds of it tourists, half of those tourists foreign. But the leisure trade in the stocks, I think, is perhaps, I hate the phrase, the easy money, but the buying there was December 21 when our borders were being locked down. That's when the real deal was happening. What we're seeing now is tourists are coming. They don't care about load shedding because they're going to hotels and Airbnbs that are immune from load shedding. They're just seeing a you know, lovely destination and man, their money goes far when they convert it to Randellas. Just like I, I was in Cape Town with some French people back in February and they just keep on like, just like chuckling to themselves. Like, really? That's what I must pay? Like, add a zero and they'll still be happy. Um, Zeta gets interesting. Zeta gets interesting. Mobility as a service. Gary Boyson's at the back. He really dug into that on my show the other day. I So there's a couple of things, right? We've got elections happening next year. Um, we've got business sort of traveling, realizing that Zoom only takes you so far. Car hire picking up, foreign tourists, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Zeta starts to look really interesting. Their idea is mobility as a service, which is kind of taking... I don't know, Airbnb and, and Uber and meshing it together. And it, it, on the surface, you look at it and you either think this is the craziest thing you've ever heard or like, hmm. I mean, let's think about Airbnb for a moment. Yeah, I'm going to put my details on a website and let a stranger come into my house. Yet it works. I mean, Uber, what's the one thing your parents told you? Don't get into a car with a stranger. Now you're like, which stranger is my stranger? So let's get to some 2024 predictions. We'll come back in a year, we'll mark them, we'll see how they went. So top 40 is still cheap. Forward PE is 10, average for 20 years, 12. A year ago, it was nine. Much of that uplift in the last year has been, uh, I mean, we've seen earnings under pressure, so it's more earnings down. Dividend yield 3.8, actually slightly up on what it was a year ago. Financials especially cheap. Uh, resources can be held by some dollar weakness, underlying demand from China. We need China. I'm just not bullish enough on China. I think China will be okay. But really, to really get things going, we want China booming. And I can't see the argument that makes China boom. I, I just can't find a compelling case for it. So top 40, yeah, okay, like it. think things can happen. Industrials, defensive. Healthcare is cheap, but I never liked the legislative risk. Bid Corp is lacquer, but look what happened to Bidvest. Priced for perfection, one stumble, that price comes under pressure. Invictus cheap. You know what? I could go on. Omnius cheap. Hudeco's cheap. There's a ton of cheap. Afrimat. Ha, that I like. Iron ore's holding up. 
I think the deal they've done looks quite attractive. A lot of the deals, the last set of results, there were things that were still being, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, projects being finalized that will start spitting cash next year. Afri match is looking really good. Robex, I mean, it's one of the surviving constructions. Sanrio's coming back with some of the tenders. I spoke with the CEO at Results, and she said, you know what, we're not even going to apply for all the tenders we won last time because we're going to change our pricing. And when she says change pricing, understand she means up, not down. They don't look for volume, they look for profit. Can't argue with that. Financials, still cheap, but I've been saying that forever. Standard Bank, their 10-month update was strong. The market didn't seem to care very much but the market was a bit sanguine. I think the market was expecting it. What really struck me with the Standard Bank update is that they're through the cycle in payments they expect to between 70 and 100 points, 0.7 and 1%. They're not yet hitting 1%. Now there's a lag. That lag is 12 to 18 months from interest rates peaking through to really showing its way through. So we're only six months into that process. But I was surprised that they're not at the 1%. They didn't give us any hard numbers. The biggest problem is there's just no GDP growth. So how do you grow? Price increases, stealing from your competitors, efficiencies, putting a squeeze on costs, none of just the good old fashioned. You know, the old way it should work, you got 3% inflation, 4% GDP growth, that just gives you 7% you can pencil in on day one of the year. Uh, not at the moment. Resource stocks, still no productions come on. We just don't have production that's come on in the last decade which means that the stuff that is there now is getting more expensive to bring out of the ground, as we saw in implants earlier in the week, more dangerous to get out of the ground. And where's the new stuff coming? There aren't very, very few greenfield projects around the world. And the process of getting mines up to speed, in Chile, you used to be able to get a copper mine up, permitting six months. A year ago, permitting was taking two years. Now the government says it's gonna take you three or three and a half years. So even if everyone suddenly decided to start doing some mining, it's going to take an age. And what about the dirty mining? Who out there is lending money for a coal mine? We need coal. I know, we're going renewable. In, in, in time, in, in the youngins' lifetime, coal will be a dirty word. It's already a dirty word. But there are 70-plus power stations being built in Southeast Asia, all of them coal-fired. They need coal. Ain't no one lending for coal. Um, Resi's the easy, weak dollar should help. Gold, and I can't believe I'm saying this. I like gold. I own gold. It feels, it just feels wrong. Here's the weirdest thing. The gold I own is making me money, which just seems illegal. But hey, you take it from whence it comes. I like gold. I'll get to that in the next slide. PGMs should get some support, but I mean, are PGMs going to the moon? On what argument? Uh, EVs. I mean, every time City do a really good, I think it's a biannual EV report. And this sits with Governor Day. He knows more about EVs than all of us. City do a really good EV update every six months on the EV market globally. And every year, their projection for when 50% of new vehicles will be electric vehicles, that date moves forward. Now, I was on holiday with, with family. One lives in Australia, one lives in France. They're both buying new cars. There is no discussion of getting an ICE internal combustion engine. This is not even a discussion. They're getting EV. Just now in South Africa, <laughs> yeah, I mean, EV, I don't know. Although what you can do, and this isn't even crazy stuff, so you power your EV and when the load shedding happens, the EV powers your house. Just saying. As I said, we're privatizing the grid. Afrimat, I like Afrimat. Gold, gold's going higher. Now, inflation is coming down and gold is a risk asset. And you should say to yourself, when well, inflation is coming down, hmm, why is gold doing well? A couple of things. Firstly, the boffins out there will tell you that every single time we've had massive rate increases, when they start coming down, we see a recession and that's good for gold. Certainly, there are still fears of a recession out there in developed markets. Secondly, remember that statement I made earlier, which was like, if, 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 if. There's a lot of uncertainty out in the market right now. And if you've got some uncertainty, what's an easy way to hedge it? Gold. It's insurance. So I like gold fields. I hold GLD. Um, gold field, but you know what? Any gold miner, they all do great. They mine the metal. Things are easy. At that pullback down there where it was coming down, I really thought we were going to get back to the bottom. That is over. Uh, I think gold will make new all-time highs next year. Gold's almost an easy one. It's a boring one. It doesn't give you yield. It does nothing. It's 
pretty, I suppose, but I buy the ETF, so it's not even pretty. Uh, retail, tough, very tough. So this was the part that I struggled most with, with putting this presentation together, because here is the bull case for, local, for the South African consumer. 2024 has been the hardest year in a long time. And let's be clear, the preceding years weren't much easier. 2020, people were losing jobs, were losing income, were stuck at home. 21 was no fun. 22 was inflation, interest rates. 23, we've got you know interest rates at 11, three quarters of a percent. Inflation was up at what, seven and change. Nothing was fun. If, and put an asterisk next to that, three, four, five ifs, there's a lot of ifs. If interest rates have peaked, if inflation has peaked, if we see inflation in the zone, maybe not four and a half, but five, there's about, if we see interest rates starting to come down, the consumer suddenly finds them in a slightly better place. Ergo, consumer stocks. But I suspect that the consumer's balance sheet is in tatters. The average South African's balance sheet is just under immense pressure. And we can see that from the data that comes out. I speak to uh, uh, folks like like um, the debt busters and people who do debt review and stuff and, and the bank serve surveys and the like. And we can see that data coming through. South Africans, and it doesn't matter your wealth gap, it doesn't matter whether you are in the you know, low LSM or the high LSM, South Africans' balance sheets have been trashed over the last couple of years. So yes, things get better next year, but don't South Africans then put some effort to repairing their balance sheet? Maybe they're behind in school fees, car payments, home loan, and they focus on that first. I think they do, but I also think that maybe we go to Spur or a famous brand signature restaurant. Jabul and Zabandi made the comment, because I was talking Pepco, and I'm like, you know, clothing, like, like clothing's like, and he's like, yo, dude, but that shirt you haven't replaced in four years is tatty. So in Jabula, I went and checked some of my shirts. Gent, you're right. <laughs> some of my shirts are looking a little bit thin bare. So I think we get some uplift. I think we do get a little more action happening. Interest rates coming down. Pepco mentioned the cost of, of, of uh, uh, interest debt. But then the ports. That's going to cost them money. Either they're air freighting or they're bringing it in early to avoid the delay or to manage the delays, and that's working capital that gets tied up. Load shedding is, you know, manageable but not going away. So then, so then it becomes, well, like, which way does the coin fall? So then I say to myself, well, if I'm taking the slightly optimistic view of 2024, and that is where I'm falling on the on, on the view I am, and I know I've been a lot of pessimistic this evening, but I'm taking the slightly optimistic view. Then the consumer is slightly better off. And then there are, I mean, Advertech, I think is certainly 24 month, uh, 12 month highs, 52 week highs, if not all time highs. Then suddenly the consumer stocks, yeah. And remember, markets are looking forward. Markets aren't so much pricing next year, they're pricing this time next year. Some of the folks are looking into 2025 already. And there's some good businesses out there. It's still going to be tough. PEP, their Brazilian operation, doing fairly well. Low LSM, so when I need to replace that threadbare shirt, I don't need to go to Woolies and get fine merino wool. And I can go to PEP and get synthetic, what, I don't know what it is, nuclear fallout, but you know what it does? All in all, it kind of looks the same. And then there's their flash business. And Keith McLaughlin's your man about that. So they've never mentioned flash. And then suddenly in the results, was it yesterday, day before, suddenly they're talking about flash. What is flash in a word? Fintech. But not fintech in the, 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 there's actually nothing there and this is all scam. Not fintech as in crypto, proper stuff. They've got a real business there that could probably be doing its own. Richmond, I like, it's cheap. China worries me because it really does need China to get things going, but I hold it and I think some luxury is not a bad thing. And I think Richmond's offering some decent valuations at this point in time. Property getting better. Office remains tough. This is the castle back to work barometer for the US. Ignore the drop to 39.2 because that was Thanksgiving weekend. The question is, who was at work on that weekend? Who were the 39% of Americans? You're like, yeah, actually, hang on, I know. Thanksgiving, everyone's at home eating turkey. They're like, I'm going to the office. Got that. Yield plus discount to NAV. 
your yields are low double digits, your discount to NAVs are 20 to 30 percent, the NAV will close to 15 or 20, and you've got so you've got 10 or so uplift in the price, you've got the nice yields coming through. LTVs a heck lot better than they were. Remember, property peaked in late 2017. Now, this wasn't a COVID put the knife in, but this thing was down and out already. Uh, the core shares prop is my preferred ETF. It's now actually the 10X prop. Um, and Spear REIT, Cape Town based, well managed, well run, nice little REIT business. They're doing some stuff in George, but they're pretty much building on spec as they get it. Small, getting out of some of the office, but when I spoke to him recently, he did say, as much as we're seeing individuals emigrate to Cape Town, he says there's evidence that so are some corporates. So their Cape Town focus could work. Cape Town, of course, has its own problem. We have water problems. They have water problems, quite simply because they are Cape Town. If you went that read that unit that United Nation climate report of was it two years ago now? The city that got mentioned the most times around water crisis, Cape Town. You fly into Cape Town, you understand why, right? There's a mountain, there's flatness. There's ocean, there's no water, and people are flooding in. And I don't know what happened after day zero. I don't know if they've done anything. I mean, I don't know. They made a master plan, desalination plants. I don't know. Anyway, I asked them about it. They already. So that's it goes back to South Africa makes a plan. Quinton Rossi at Spear, they are already making plan for water shortages. Don't wait for it to happen. Get ahead of the curve. Leisure, as I said, done well, but I'm not sure what. Tourists are coming, big driver, elections, corporates for help, car hire, I like Cedar. Cash, retail savings bonds, they reset tomorrow. So if you want these rates, rush home and get them now. I think they come down because you can track the five year. The five year on the market is currently about half a percent lower than it was when it was set a month ago at 1125. But this will move around, particularly in an election year. Our bonds will fluctuate. The inflation linked. And inflation plus five and a quarter is the highest in the history of these and will also be coming down. And inflation linked only changes every 10 years. It's weird. Bonds, they're not just boring. They like, who cares about bonds except now I own truckload of these because I picked up a whole bunch at 11 and a half percent. Inflation five and a half, six percent real return. That's an equity like return. In fact, it's better than what we're getting on equity, but it's bond risk. The question you're saying is, can't the government default? Sure. If they default, we've got bigger problems. We're queuing into Zimbabwe and that Great Bridge Boulder Post is a nightmare. Thing is, they don't default because they own the printing press. I know inflation, currency devaluation, et cetera, et cetera. But <clears throat> interest rates, locally, March, uh, May, uh, June. I think June. Uh, I think we'll get three cuts to take us down to 11%. US. I know the market is saying March or May, they're completely stupid. It will be June. Declining rates good for business because they're all being hurt. We've seen this in a bunch of results coming through. CEOs saying our interest bill is costing us more. Well, of course, interest rates are higher. That comes down. It doesn't solve the problem. It just takes a little bit of pain off what is otherwise a very painful experience right now, being a CEO in South Africa. USA, I... So the hardest thing was retail, the consumer. The second hardest was, do we see a recession? This time last year, I really thought we would. We haven't. And if you look out there, there's still a bunch of people way smarter than me saying recession is coming and it's coming and it's absolutely going to happen. I'm saying no, but I'm doing it in a technical term because a recession is two negative quarterly GDP prints. And I think the US can avoid that, but not by much. I don't think it's going to be by very much. Tech is expensive, Magnificent Seven. Russell is essentially their mid-cap index. And whereas earlier we were looking at the charts of the S&P and the NASDAQ, and they were all finishing up here, there's the Russell. There is the Russell year to date. It is red. This is mid-cap America. High rates, high inflation, hurting. Higher labor costs, hurting. This has been hurting them. I think it can avoid a recession. The economy is doing okay, but it's not going to be knock it out the park GDP. European Union, war in Ukraine continues, not ending. Markets are cheap. I like the Signia European ETF. Had a spectacular year, 26% up this year, helped in part by some currency weakness, but we'll take wherever the return comes from. Okay, getting into some nuts and bolts. I've run my time. I will get to the end quick. So stocks, which will come back next year and revisit these. Top right and Pepco. 
Shop right always. We've got to eat, right? We have to eat. And no one can afford Woolies right now. And even if you're feeling rich next year, you're still not going to Woolies. You're going to shop right. Why? Because they just do it better than everybody else. Uh, Pepco, because I need to replace my, tag, my tatty shirts. And they've got some good businesses. And I like Brazil. Well, I've never been to Brazil. The Brazil operation, I like. That trick's funny because that's the easy way to take the banks. If you want to be more crafty, I like Standard Bank. There's a good argument to be said for uh, first round. Stay the heck away from ABSA. It's always cheap. It's been cheap for longer than it's been ABSA. Zeta, because those were good results. And they've got rid of all the debt, all the unbundling debt that came on board. And they've got the mobility business, which sounds weird. And I like management. I, I've held combined motor holding for a while, and most of my return has been in dividend. But... 15% a year dividend is fine. Um, but I'm going to, I might move that into, into Zeta. I like Zeta. Zeta's looking nice. And initially, when it comes from an unbundling oak, right? Because someone's sitting there and they got Zeta and they're like, I don't want Agri. And I don't realize that there's now two Zetas and it's come. So there's a lot of people who just sell it because they don't like it. Price falls. Now, when the price starts to rise, we've got stale bulls. So now there's more selling pressure. Ah, that'll fade away. I think Zeta's a nice operation. Um, Satrix Resi, yeah, it's the lazy. I think the Resi, sure, gold and gold fields, and then Afrimat, which comes in a moment. Afrimat's the nice and easy in that regard there, and that gives us nice iron ore and industrial metals. Uh, CS Prop or Spear Reit or bits of both in those, the Signia EU, uh, and then Afrimat down at the bottom. We'll come back in a year and see how those did. Ah, sorry, Richmond at the bottom. My bad. Sorry, Richmond. Big ideas. We'll come back and mark these next year. Top 40 higher. Man, if I could say, please, I mean, like, I'm going to say higher. And I'm going to say ran stronger. And if there's one thing I'm least convinced about, it is that one. There is a compelling story for Iran to be stronger. But in the election year, and if China doesn't come to the party, there's a compelling reason to say no. Let's see. You know what? Foreigners might like a coalition government more than an ANC government, and that might just see some cash flow in. Get in the block, eh? There's no flat here. It's up or down. It's binary. There's no hiding. Load shedding ongoing. That's the easiest prediction of the entire evening. Transnet is still a problem. Somehow that one is even easier. Uh, rate cuts by mid-year. I don't expect in first quarter. I think we will see cuts. As I said, I think the rate hiking cycle has peaked. Uh, I think Prime will end the year at 11%. It's only 75 points down, but central bankers are by their DNA cautious. Uh, Russia, as I said, ongoing. Brent higher, but I don't expect it above 90. Although on my way here, I hear that OPEC Plus is looking for more production cuts. We'll see how that plays out. Uh, US Green, S&P and NASDAQ. And that is, again, more than anything, going to be the Magnificent Seven. Are they expensive? Sure. Do they have compelling investment cases? You betcha. And you can say what you want about AI. I mean, the, the, the tech that, um, that, that NVIDIA has, that Grace Hopper 200. I mean, that is a, a radical piece of chip that no one is close to having. I know everyone's making their own. They're not close yet, not for large language models. Uh, China, I think GDP is going to be under five, and that bothers me for South Africa. It'll be positive, but not much. Gold will make all-time highs. We're about $40. We could even do it this year. Still, uh, as I said, no U.S. recession. We won't get the two negative quarters. It'll be close, but we won't quite get there. ETFs, your tax-free accounts. Same old, same old. Max out if you can. Keep on buying. Don't panic. Don't take the money out. Maybe we'll get an increase in the annual limit in February, perhaps. But either way, just keep on buying your ETFs. Nice and simple. And that's the year. Ladies and gents, I just, I, I'm going to end with, with just two things. One quick thing. As I said up front, this is a hard one to put together. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of pessimism out there as well. Um, one of the things someone asked me when they heard I was preparing this, they said to me, is South Africa becoming a failed state? My answer, which saddens me ridiculously, um, we've become. February earlier this year, I woke up one morning in my flat in Bramfontein, no water, no power, no internet. I know those are first world problems, but that to me, certainly a failed city. But let's also be clear, South Africa is a state. Uh, we have rule of law. We have a party that doesn't like losing, but has lost and stepped aside. We have elections. We are a democracy. We do not have to be Zimbabwe or Venezuela to be a failed state. And we can come back from where we are. 
it is going to be a tough couple of years. The comment I made earlier that we are privatizing by stealth. We'll be doing our own solar power. We're going to find ways to do our own boreholes. South Africans make a plan. It's what we do. It's in our DNA. It is tough out there right now. It's not going to get untough anytime quick, but that doesn't mean it's over. And that's my honest view. It's not going to get better in a hurry, but I think it can get better, not without risks and not without trauma on the way. As always, look after yourself. If you can, look after someone else as well. Appreciate your time this evening.